begin. What my plan is today is we're going to just finish off some of the stuff about offers still going. And for those of you who weren't at the online shoot last night um, or who are listening and haven't actually listened to the online shoot yet, go back to that because we did a whole heap of content in there as well this time. But I have, and I'm saying it in front of everybody, I've made a solemn promise that next week's shoot will start with and will not finish until we have worked our way through a problem from start to finish because we need to do a little bit of that. And we will work through the Zeta and Susanna problem that many of you will have submitted last night if you were doing the online problems. Uh, if you're not, particularly if you're a face-to-face -face student, you might want to do it between now and the weekend so that you get a chance to have some sense of how you went when we work through it step by step. Um, and basically, if you are online and you're doing it for marks, do it anyway. You will get a deduction for it being late if you haven't done it, but at least I won't turn it off and not do it, not give you feedback. Where with you guys, you face-to-face -face people, I'll turn it off as soon as I start giving feedback because there's a point in time when I run out of time. So we're going to go finish off some of the stuff about options, uh, about offers, but particularly options and a couple of and lapsing. Then I've got a quiz for you, which hopefully we'll get to before we have a break, and then we're going to talk about acceptance. Okay. So firstly, I want to talk about options. Um, there's a fair amount in the text and the text and the casebook about it, but I want to make sure we all understand what an option is and how an option is different from an offer. Is there anybody in the room who is prepared to have a go at explaining what an option is? Remember, the way you learn the most is by sharing your ideas with other people. Sarisha, I'm going to walk over here so that you can share with the online people as well. Um, so an option is a situation where... Loud enough so the other people in the room can hear you as well. <laughs> Not just me. An option is a situation where the offerer puts an offer, puts, makes an offer, but also puts a condition in place to say if this condition is met, then it actually is... A, a, the offer can be, for example, left open. So for instance, if the offerer says that I'm prepared to hold this open for you for 24 hours provided you pay me $100, that is an option. Excellent. Excellent. So the I, an option is an enforceable option, offer. So an option is a particular type of contract. It is a promise to make an offer available for a period of time. We see them in all sorts of places. See them on the stock exchange where people actually trade options. Options are contracts that allow people to buy a share at a particular price. So if you have a, uh, have we got any day traders amongst us? Anyone who want to pick a stock? I don't want know what any of them are worth at the moment. Let's say that today, I'll probably get it here see wrong, Commonwealth Bank shares are worth Anyone who want to hazard a guess? I've got nothing. Let's call them $10 a share. That could be a bargain. It could be five times what they're worth. I have no idea. Let's say today Commonwealth Bank shares are trading at $10 each. Um, if you had an option to buy those shares for a price of $8, that would mean you had a contract with someone who had promised that they would sell you those shares, regardless of what the market value is on any particular day, at for $8. So you could immediately buy a Commonwealth Bank share for $8 because you've got that contract in place and then put it on the market and sell it for 10 and make a profit, right? So the options themselves become valuable. So they trade on the market, usually at a slight discount to their price. Another really common form of option is an option over real estate. So you will often see when you're going past places that are for lease, residential tenancies that are for lease, uh, you know, this gorgeous restaurant space, uh, beauty salon, bank, STCA, subject to council approval, uh, we are um, leasing it to you, it, we, we will lease it um, for five years plus, and it often says five by three by two or something like that. So five years up front plus three additional two-year terms, two-year options. 
So what that means is that the tenant can come in and commit to a five-year lease and then they have an option to renew the lease, usually on terms that might include that you've paid your rent up until this point and that you haven't damaged the property or whatever it is. But if you've complied with the terms of the original lease, the tenant has the option to require the landlord to keep them as a tenant for another two years. And at the end of that period, they get another two years if they want to. So it is, when you think about it, it's an option, is an, it's a promise to hold an offer open. But as going back to what Sarisha said at the beginning, the really important point she made right at the end there, that it is a contract that it is a promise based on a condition. So if you pay me $100, I'll keep the offer open until tomorrow. That is what turns it from an offer into a contract. It is a promise to keep an offer open. So if I promise to sell you this telephone that doesn't belong to me, um, looks like it's almost fully charged, um, if I offer to sell that to you, at any point in time, I can withdraw my offer before you accept. I've just withdrawn it because it doesn't belong to me and I will get into trouble for selling something belongs to somebody else. But if you said, I'd really like to think about buying that, I'm not sure if I can or not, will you hold that offer open for me until tomorrow? I might just say yes and because I'm a decent person, tomorrow it might in fact still be open. I might not have withdrawn it and you'll be fine. But if I decide not to, if I withdraw my offer, you can't sue me for withdrawing the offer unless we had a contract that I would keep the offer open. And the only way you can have a contract with me to keep the offer open is if all of the elements of contract are present. So the elements of contracts are, together please, agreement comprising offer and acceptance or if we can't find both of them, maybe consensus. Consideration, for the time being, we will call that price. Intention, an intention to enter into a legally binding relationship of some sort. And lastly, certainty, all of which we'll talk about. So that's, I know it took a long time to talk about it, but I think options are ultimately very simple, but they do create confusion. So there are a couple of cases that you have uh, in the text and otherwise, and that's where they basically land. Uh, a promise to hold an offer open is only a binding one if the promise is made as a contract. Let's look at a different kind of promise, I've kind of given the end away, a different kind of promise to keep an offer open. So in this case, Welcome and Mobile, um, basically, as, have most of you heard of a franchise? You know what a franchise yep. is? McDonald's. McDonald's is a really good example of a franchise. <laughs> Burger King, most pet, many petrol stations. Um, Mobile ran a, fr a franchise operation. Um, so what a, a franchisor basically owns intellectual property, branding, recipes, seven secret herbs and spices, whatever it is, um, and a methodology for doing something. And they enter into a contract with a franchisee under which the franchisee <coughs> promises that they will operate the business consistently with the franchise documents, uh, use the intellectual property in a particular way, and as in return for that, they get to operate their McDonald's restaurant or their KFC or their mobile service station. And they effectively pay a fee for doing that. The fee under franchise arrangements, they're contracts. So they're negotiated and it could be anything. Um, they tend to be a percentage of turnover, um, but they're often a flat fee and then a reducing percentage of turnover. They could be anything really. So Mobile had a whole heap of franchisees and it pulled them all together at some stage and said, OK, dudes, because they are all dudes at this stage, they're all mechanics and stuff like that. And they say, OK, what we're going to do is we want you to lift your game. We want you to make more money. We want you to make more money for you. We want you to make more money for us. So we're developing this thing that we're going to call the circle of excellence. Sounds a bit cultish, doesn't it? Circle of excellence. It's going to be a scheme, it's going to run over a period of years and if you actually meet these criteria, 
Um, we're going to, it, the people who meet it, we are going to renew their franchises for a nine year period. So there was a valuable, because when the franchise agreements end, they usually have to be renegotiated. So that was pretty cool. Um, they did say though, you know, we're not really sure exactly what it's going to look like now. We're, uh, you know, we're introducing it. We're pretty sure you're going to need to consistently achieve 90% in these particular sort of earnings. But we've, we've got to work out what the details are and we'll work out what the details are later. So some of the franchisees knuckled down. They got their circles and their excellences are aligned and they started to make more money. But Mobile never quite got around to getting the details right. They went backwards and forwards a few times and then by about the four year period from memory, they said, yeah, actually we're gonna pull that program. We're not going to do that anymore. So not surprisingly, a number of the franchises, franchisees, the ones who had been making that 90% performance target or more, I think I just did that because I wanted to show my cursor off. Um, the ones who wanted to do that were basically very upset about it and said, well, we want, uh, you know, you need to keep this promise. You need to keep that offer open. So, and at the first instance, Justice Wilcox agreed with them. Uh, he said that they had made an offer and that they weren't entitled to revoke it because it was a unilateral offer and that once the franchise ha franchisees had em embarked on doing the thing that was required, it was too late to withdraw it. So what do we think about that? Is it similar to your example from last week? Just... It is exactly the same as my example of looking for a lost dog, effectively. So how did that end up? I think Clay was looking for the lost dog and at one point um, we went through the scenario well, what would happen if, uh, it was Emily wasn't it, decided she didn't want a dog anymore and she withdrew it. What, what was the answer at that point? Well I'm not exactly sure I remember because I think there was a bit of uncertainty about it, it would depend on when they withdrew the... Yeah. Well basically we disagreed last week with Justice Wilcox. We said, well if Emily had communicated to the rest, uh, uh, you know, in a reasonable way, the same way that she had communicated there was a reward for her lost dog, she had, if there was objective evidence that she had withdrawn her offer before the thing that the unilateral offeree had been asked to do was done, well, effectively, too bad, so sad. Where Justice Wilcox is saying no, Actually, that's not the case. If it's an unilateral offer, then actually they've started to do something. They've expended money, they've acted in reliance. So, on that first instance, he found that there was a contract, but then it went on appeal. So, just hold that thought for a minute. Um, so, on appeal, Mobile said, look, no, you're wrong as a matter of law, and as you now all know, things don't make it to the High Court unless we have a matter of law to appeal on. Um, and basically we did, like Emily might have with the lost dog, we revoked our offer before the earliest time for acceptance could have occurred. That there was a period of time, I, my memory is six years, to be quite frank, all of you will have read this case more recently than I have, so you can correct me and I will stand corrected on the dates. But I think they said it was going to run over six years and at about year four, they pulled out. Um, franchisees on the other side said, oh, no, we've, Wilcox is right, we started performing and we've done, it was a year by year thing. So we've achieved 90% each of those years. So on appeal, the High Court, so we've got Justices Lockhart, Lindgren and Tamberlin said that there was no legally effective offer made. No implied contract not to revoke the offer because the proposals were too vague, uncertain, or too vague and too uncertain to be capable of giving rise to a contractual obligation. Um, basically, one of the reasons I like this case and I want to bring it to your attention is again, it stipulates the High Court decision sets out what the rules are in relation to unilateral offer. Um, they basically call out Justice Wilcox here and says you can't, even though 
yes, this is a stressful situation for these franchisees to be in, um, and yes, it might feel like an unfair decision, big, powerful, multinational uh, oil company basically screwing some local mechanics. Um, that's a technical legal expression, by the way. Um, uh, at the end of the day, we're not going to change the law. I'm paraphrasing the High Court, by the way, they didn't actually say <laughs> it's a bad thing. So, um, from the judgment, we do not accept that there is a universal proposition that an offeror is not at liberty to revoke the offer once the offeree commences or embarks on performance of the sort, of, sort act of acceptance. So, what's the impact of this? An offer made in return for performance of an act is revocable at any time. Revocable? Revocable? Sorry, I don't work for the ABC, I don't know. Um, normally, I'm, I'm standing with my back to you because normally, I, before I've been able to see over there, and we still haven't turned that one on. Um, so, however, we might have, and this word comes up over and over again, this idea of a stopple. So, an estoppel could arise, so remember, an estoppel is an equitable remedy that stops someone from claiming a right under a contract or the non-existence of a contract or whatever it happens to be if they had induced somebody to take an action. So if there would be some sort of unfairness. But in this case, they said, well, actually, at the end of the day, these franchisees got off their bum, they did a few things, and their profits went up and they made more money than they would have done if they hadn't actually made those changes. So, in fact, the things that they did were not directly... They might have been inspired to an extent by this opportunity to get locked into their contract for a longer period of time, but at the end of the day, they made more money for doing it. It wasn't like they had to expend a whole lot of money up front or anything like that. So the High Court found no contract. Questions, concerns, frustrations? Did they actually sign a document? Did they sign a document? No, they didn't sign a document. There was nothing to sign. They hadn't got any further along. Um, I've forgotten your name. David. Programs like frequent flyers, rewards, that kind of thing where you accrue a certain number of points over time and then they shut it down. Is it a similar sort of situation? I'm going to go shaky. I, in the order of eight million points when ANSET went under. <laughs> I know it's a long time ago, but I'm still sad. So not so much under, but they just changed the... Changed the no, conditions. ANSET. Yeah, no, ANSET. <laughs> it, it died. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, sorry. Uh, so frequent flyer points... Um, again, I'd, I'd need a scenario, but usually so, if you have a contract with a frequent flyer points organisation, you get your points from flying or you get them from using a credit card or whatever it happens to be, um, and then they will say, you can use these points for these kinds of things, but the kinds of things that are available one day might be different from the things that are available at another day. So, so along these lines, yeah, but we changed our mind and we don't think it's such a great program anymore, so we're going to... And we're going to pull it. We're going to pull it. Um, it'll go to the terms and conditions as to whether yeah. there's a contract or not. So each time, each of these... It's an excellent question because each of these we need to look at on the facts. And the law that we get is a consequence of the cases that happen. So one of the things I know you'll hear me say over and over again, I haven't forgotten you, um, one is that learning how to write a contract by looking at the cases is like learning how to have a happy marriage by only talking to divorced people or learning how to raise a child by only talking to DHS or foster parents or something, or people whose children have been taken away to, from them. Um, it's informative, it helps us, we know what went wrong, but it doesn't actually necessarily tell us what it is that we need to do right. Like, I don't know, trying to work out your own mental health, whether you're mentally healthy or not, by talking to people in a psych ward. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, for a contract to end up in the High Court, the relationships of the parties has to have broken down so far that not only were they prepared to go to court the first time, but the second and the third time as well. So, uh, yeah, so each of them are instructive, but we get the law that we get from the cases that are there. 
Um, you're David, aren't you? Yeah, good. Sorry, I'm just trying to remember names as I go, and I don't remember Ken. yours. Ken, okay. your um, question. So how is this much different if, for the dog example that we had last week, could the person have argued that, oh, I've spent X amount of hours looking for the dog, therefore it would be unfair for you to pull the offer? Um, did everybody hear that question? So what do you think? How would, in our little scenario, could Clay have argued, I've spent a whole lot of time and effort looking for this dog, can, it's unfair for you to pull the offer? I'm coming over here. Sorry, I just need no, you on the recording. Um, would it be that the offer, one of the conditions, was the return of the dog? And if you hadn't yet returned the dog, therefore, Absolutely. you the, can revoke? The, the reward is for the return dog. Mm. And, and the short answer is it's the same because actually by the end it was found no contract. So you could withdraw. But if on your terms and conditions that you had... If you had said, I will reward anybody who goes looking... Now, we haven't got to it yet, and I'll skip the slides when we get to it, but um, uh, one of the cases you might have come across is Lampley and Braithwaite. I don't think it's in your case book, but I th it is available to you as a download on cam Canvas. I really like Lampley and Braithwaite, um, although it, it, and it gives us this principle. So I can't remember which one was which, but there was a lord, um, muckety-muck, and I, uh, I'll come to you when we've done this. So, and he was wasting away in prison somewhere because he had been accused of doing something. I think it was treasonous, but it might have just been, it, it doesn't really matter what it was he did. And his mate, the other one, Lampley or Braithwaite, basically they had a conversation and he said, look, I'm going to look after you. I am going to do everything that it takes to help you get a pardon. So he amassed horses, had to stay in inns, went and chatted to people. But before he could get this pardon organised, let's say Lord Lampley, I really can't remember which way around they are, died in prison. So Braithwaite came along and put in his... Uh, I really hate saying the names because I really have no idea. Um, put in his claim for his expenses for amassing his horses and staying at inns and whining and dining other lords to get on the king's good side. And the children of the lord who had wasted away said, nah, 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 we're not going to pay you no contract. There was not... Firstly, you didn't do it. If, if there was a unilateral offer, you, um, you didn't actually discuss what the consideration would be. You didn't discuss what the terms were. There's nothing in writing. So, but even if there was an offer that we will give you a reward if you succeed, you didn't succeed, you hadn't finished. And the court in that case found, well, actually, it was pretty much understood what it is, that it, it went without saying, largely because these were gentlemen, and Ted wanted to talk about money. So, and maybe if they hadn't both been gentlemen, the um, end result might have been slightly different. But there was always an understanding that at the very least he would be compensated for his out of pocket expenses of going on this journey to try and get the pardon. So, again, each of them turns on the facts. Helpful, unhelpful, I've just given you two that work the same way and one that works differently, a little bit from column A, a little bit from column B. Um, you're going to need to look at the facts in each case. Um, again, that's probably a good example, Lampley and Braithwaite, which is quite an old case now. It's a, I think it's a seven, like a eight, it's an 18th century case. Um, it might even be earlier. Um, so the court was more likely to ha take a more subjective view as to what the parties might have thought or believed than an objective view. And maybe, though, their objective view is based on them both being gentlemen, I don't know. Uh, so, next thing I want to point out to you is how offers lapse. So, the language I've used a couple of times now is that in order to reach agreement, we've got this... Uh, offer, this 
DNA of the deal, this that can ripen into an acceptance or ripen into an agreement when it is accepted. So acceptance needs, without acceptance, unless we've got consensus in some other way, we don't have an agreement. An offer is not a contract. An offer is not an agreement until it has been accepted. So at any point prior to it being accepted, if it lapses or it is withdrawn, then the acceptance itself becomes meaningless if there is one and we don't have an agreement. So offers can lapse in a whole heap of different ways. <laughs> Firstly, they can just lapse over time. It might be that when I make the offer at the beginning, so this phone that's charging away here, I'm happy to sell it to the highest bidder. Um, actually, no, let's make it a proper offer. I'm happy to sell it for $10 to by the end of this class. So I've given you a time limit. But then I could say almost immediately afterwards, actually, no, it's now a million dollars. I've changed it. It's now a new offer. Um, effectively, by creating that new offer, I have terminated the old offer. Or I could just say, no, I don't want to sell it anymore. It's no longer for sale. I've terminated it. If I promise you that I will keep the offer open for uh, until the end of the class and you pay me something for, for that promise, I make a contract with you to keep the offer open, then I will be in breach of that contract if I don't keep the offer open for the rest of the class. Um, sometimes I might just say I'll sell it to the first person who's prepared to buy it for a million dollars. And in 2070, one of you comes down to my estate, as in, my, because by then I'm hoping to be well under the ground, uh, and you say to my heirs and successors, um, Catherine offered to sell me a mobile phone for a million dollars back on the 4th of August 2019. And in 2070, I'm assuming that a million dollars will be, you know, what, the equivalent of $7.50 or something. And so that's a pretty good deal for you. And my estate, what will they be doing at that time? What do you reckon? I haven't ever withdrawn that offer. Does my estate have to go out or my children's heirs and successors? Do they have to do anything? No, Sharisha's saying no. Yeah. So why not? Reasonable time? And the death of the offeror threw them both in. Well, unless, of course, I've been cryovacked or something. We might have a whole new definition of what life is. So, um, in general rule, death of an offeror will terminate the offer, at least where the offeree knows that the offeror has died. If you don't know that the offeror has died, um, then there have been circumstances where uh, the estate is bound to accept. Um, and that's... Um, Fong and Chile is a good example of that. Um, Leibat and Amico is a case which talks about um, the ability to enforce an option after the offeror dies. So how does that work? Why can an option be enforced when an offer can't? It's a deceptively... I'm, I'm making it sound like a tricky question. It's actually deceptively evil, easy. Clay? Time yes, the option is it's a contract. So the option, a contract will continue. A contract will succeed the life of the parties. So if I'm, otherwise, <laughs> there'd be way more. No, I'm not going to say that. That's a very inappropriate thing to say. Um, at the end of the day, the contract. Once we have a contract, and an option is a form of contract, um, the contract will continue, and an estate will be bound by contracts that a deceased entered into. A company that enters into a contract that goes into liquidation, um, will the, the liquidators will need to address the contracts that they've entered into before the company is wound up. Now, if it goes into voluntary liquidation just to end its life, that's usually no harm, no foul, but liquidation because they've run out of money, then all of the contracts need to be dealt with in a fair way, and those of you who want to do liquidation will learn more about that. Okay. 
Another way that offers laps is by being rejected. And this one, I mentioned this actually in the tute, this tends to be something that commercial people forget about and we as lawyers need to guide them about from time to time. So if I make you an offer, again, let's, I'm just using this phone that's charging away here, and I say I'm going to offer, I'm offering that phone for 200 bucks, and you say to me, no way, there is absolutely no way I'm paying that much for that phone. And then towards the end of class, you realise this phone is charged and yours has run out and you're desperate to get on Tinder or whatever it is that you want to do. And so you're ready to front up with that $200 for me. Um, and I say, no, piss off. Can I do that? Yes, I can, because you have rejected the offer. I haven't needed to withdraw it. Similarly, if you say to me, I won't buy it for 200, but I'll buy it for 100, and I say, no, the price, well, I'm not prepared to take that offer, you have actually made me a counter offer, and the counter offer acts as a rejection of the original offer. Now, why I say this is a trick for young commercial players is often commercial negotiations, people will be trying to work out how much money is on the table. So they're asking for a million dollars, let's see if we can get it for 800,000. And when the counter offer of 800,000 is rejected and somebody goes back to the table and says, well, I'll take it for a million dollars, the vendor may well say, well, no, you won't. I'm not prepared to sell it to you. That offer, you rejected that, my original offer. I told you it was my lowest and final offer. I am not prepared to negotiate with you anymore. And there's absolutely nothing to stop people from doing that. Happens very rarely, but I've seen it happen a number of times, uh, enough times to, to warn you about it. And you will see that, that people get very narky with their lawyers when that happens. You work in conveyancing, don't you? You would have seen that happen a few times. Oh, I see that. Yeah. I just see you that. see it all the time? I see that one today. Yeah. Once a day. Today. Today. Yeah. today. Uh, can you give us a scenario? Uh, I'm a real estate agent, you know, previously there is an, a guy just to make us an offer like a 2.8 for a property and uh, the vendor just, you know, countersigned for, you know, for 2.63. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the guy just, you know, keep negotiating, negotiating and then the vendor just changed the line. Just they didn't no. come back and they just give, you know, the original offer to the vendor said, no, we want three. Yeah. Because we have no place to live. We've got no, yeah. Well, yeah. and it's, and they can do that. Yeah. Even though they're at one stage they've said that they would be prepared to sign at a particular yeah. price. Doesn't, and I've seen it done not just because I have no place to live, I actually, and I don't work in real estate very often, it's just because actually, no, this is not how we want to do business. Particularly in service agreements where I'm, I'm getting you to put some code together for me and install some machines and do some stuff. And it's just like, actually, no, if we can't have a meaningful conversation, we're going to go backwards and forwards like this when we're negotiating the deal. This is when we should be getting along the best. Then I don't actually want to do business with you. And I've seen that happen a number of times. And we have to remember, we're talking about the law here, but contract is a verb as well as a noun. And the contracting, the agreement part, is the part our clients do. Okay, sorry, just on that, so the offer's a million dollars. What if I... I'm just curious. Can I say to you, I'm considering your offer of a million dollars, but was wondering if you had any scope to go any lower? Love your question. I'm considering your offer, but I'm wondering if you have any scope to get any longer. Is that a counter offer? What do we think? No. 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 What would you call it? Inquiry. An inquiry, a request for information. Absolutely. And again, a court would look at the circumstances each time. Uh, counter offers are rejected. Yeah, okay. Um, by the way, I'm, this is the most ridiculously long slide pack. I think it's just early on when I was doing it for the first time. I'm not very good at editing out, and I've found that uh, people tend to like to have the slide packs. I've got a little summary of the cases. You appreciate a little bit lot more when you're getting ready for the exam, and <coughs> ten weeks ago was a very long time, um, but. Don't, the, the payoff is we can't look at every slide. There's like 150 of the buggers.